This passage takes place in the context of Matthew 18, where Jesus is talking about his community, how we are a community that values humility and not pride, how we do not boast in who is the greatest, but we rejoice in what Christ has done for us. We're also a seeking community that cares about the lost and seeks out those who are astray and far from God. And we rejoice when they are reconciled, as we saw when we unpacked the parable of the lost sheep. And because of the cross of Jesus Christ, where he paid the price of every sin, reconciling to him is as simple as believing this good news confessing our sins and repenting from the heart of our former ways according to the flesh. And the good news is that if when we do so, he will remove our sins as far as the east is from the west. And that's why they call it good news, because that is that is exactly what every heart needs. However, not all who are lost or astray are outside the church. Sometimes it happens inside. Because frankly, you know, until we reach the other side of eternity, we will always be dealing with sin in the church because this the church is made up of sinners. That's the problem. <laughs> and for <clears throat> but For most of us, when sin does come knocking at the door of the church, it's as easy as, again, repenting and confessing our sins, receiving God's pardon, and just continuing in our Christian life. But every once in a while, someone in the church will refuse to acknowledge their sin, refuse to repent of it, refuse to confess it. And sometimes that's out of pride. Sometimes it's ignorance, arrogance. Or perhaps they just simply weren't a Christian in the first place. All of the above happen. And Jesus' plan to deal with unrepentant sin in the church, Jesus has given his community a three-step process to handle it that we began to unpack last week with the singular goal of reconciling with the offending party. The first was to tell the person, yourself, their sin. And if they refuse to hear you, you take another brother or sister in the Lord or two with you, and you attempt to reconcile with the, with you as a group. And if they refuse to refuse to hear even the group, you bring it to the church, you bring it to the assembly of God's people, and you attempt as God's collective people to work this out, to get people to recognize their sin and to lay it at the foot of the cross. And if at any stage in that process, they do see their sin for what it is and repent, that's great news. They're forgiven. You guys are reconciled. There is peace and purity in the church. This is a good thing. But if they still do not uh, refuse to recognize their sin, they're to be treated as a Gentile or a tax collector. People who are recognized in the first century to be clearly outside of the church and not in right relationship with God or his people. But we remember that this comes from the writings of the gospel according to Matthew. Who was Matthew? Former tax collector. We're reminded that by that simple fact that every saint has a past, but every sinner can have a future. Now, regretfully, we don't see this being practiced enough in the church as a whole today, and And it shows, if we're being honest. You know, discipline, for instance, has been removed from the school systems. And look at what's happened to the school systems in the last couple of years. (laughs) I mean, every teacher that I've talked to that has a long enough tenure says things are getting worse and worse every year. Am I to believe that's a coincidence? Well, there's a lot of reason, contributing reasons, but that's one of them. And we're reminded, you know, discipline itself is not a bad thing. The the very word discipline is where we get the word disciple from. You you know that thing that we're supposed to be of Jesus, disciples of Jesus? It's where we get the word from. (laughs) 
And, you know, and remember, d- discipline in the church is just the, the outworking of the Christian walk. It's meant to be restorative and not punitive. The prophet Hosea wrote that God desires mercy and not sacrifice. Oh, but pastor, Jesus says, judge not. How can you judge your brother or sister through, through judgment and discipline and recognizing them not to be one of you guys? That sounds so unchristlike. It's, it's, it's what Christ told us to do. <laughs> and moreover, yes, Jesus did say judge not, but read the rest of that verse. We covered it some time ago when we went through the Sermon on the Mount. That's not saying don't ever say something negative towards somebody. It's saying beware hypocritical judgment. It's about making sure that if I say, hey, you shouldn't be doing such and such, I better not be doing the same thing. That's what Jesus was against because that's what the Pharisees were guilty of all the time. So look, there's a place in the conversation for this hesitancy to judge, but that doesn't mean don't discipline. It's a reminder that we always need to check our motives when we approach this subject. Are we seeking restoration or are we seeking retribution? Because one of those things is not our job. God said, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. That's not my care. That's that. That's not where I'm supposed to, that's not the lane I'm supposed to be running in. Because we're sinners too, after all. We gotta be careful. And with that in mind, we remember that the only sin that causes church discipline, as is outlined in this chapter, is a hard-hearted refusal to repent and be reconciled. It's a hard-hearted refusal to let the Holy Spirit do His work of drawing us to repentance and to be restored. Because frankly, you know, I don't want to be in a place where I'm judging, oh, your sin is too bad for this church. Oh, this sin is too bad. Oh, that one's not acceptable, but this one is. I don't want to be in that place. Because frankly, you know, your sin is no worse than mine. It, <clears throat> and that's why I say all the time, we you know, that Christians are not saved because we are better people. Christians are saved because we are a forgiven people. That's the difference. I might well be a worse sinner than you are. My sins might be worse. I don't deny that. But I live a lifestyle of repentance of the sins I struggle against. You know, just ask my family sometime. (laughs) They'll be the first to line up and say, oh yeah, he's a sinner. My wife could name them all off. <laughs> but she'll, but them and even my kids will, will, will be, will also testify, hey, when I step out of line, I own it. I don't boast about much, but I know when I need to own what I've done wrong. I'll be, and make that, make that move to apologize when I'm clearly the one in the wrong, which is what all of this is about. So just tying up, Some more loose ends. Are there any examples in Scripture of church discipline like this taking place? Oh, absolutely. First thing that came to mind is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where one person who was named a brother was committing a sin so grotesque, and you can look it up for yourself, that even the Gentile outsiders were looking at what he was doing and like, dude, this is messed up. That's when you know you're... (laughs) In a bad place. So Paul took the initiative and ejected such a person from the church and says, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. And that's what we call tough love. Because, I mean, I mean, hear the concern he has for his soul in the in that last part of that verse that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So he's, get the picture, he's putting him out of the church, putting him out of God's assembly, recognizing him not to be part of the kingdom of God, putting him into the realm of Satan, who's the prince of the power of the air, outside of the kingdom of God, so that his sinful, proud flesh would be destroyed, and that in humility, he would come to his senses and be restored. That's what this passage is talking about. 
We also see this in Galatians chapter 2, which is kind of an exception to this rule, which is why I'm glad I, I, we made time to, to talk about it. Because in, in Galatians 2, this is when Peter was slipping into the error of legalism, kind of teaching a false gospel now that you still had to follow the law to be saved, corrupting the gospel in a very public way. And it says that Paul opposed Peter to his face and rebuked them before them all, it says. Interesting. Hold on, John, you were just telling me you have to follow this process, go to the person yourself, and now he's rebuking them before all. What's going on here? Do we have a contradiction? No, I don't think so, because there's a principle throughout Scripture that private And personal sins are handled privately and personally. It said, remember the, the, this text begins by saying, if your brother sins against you. But this is different. This is a public and visible sin that was to be rebuked publicly and visibly. That's the difference. It was done openly. And that's why I have no hesitation myself calling out False teachers or even denominations that have gone astray because their error is plain to see for all, often in many cases celebrated as they do so. And the emphasis changes rather than private reconciliation to rather protecting those who would be led astray by them. That's why I have no problem in some cases calling out well-known doctrinal errors or or well-known false teachers so that we don't fall into their snare by accident. I hope this makes sense to you guys because there's a magnitude of difference between sinning against one person and bringing about the sin of false teaching to a whole group of people. That's why Paul handled it differently in Galatians 2. Hope that makes sense. Those are two incidents that you can find in Scripture, and I could go exhaustively for a whole other sermon. But the same thing happened in that one and all the other ones. Sins are rebuked, and the purity of the church is maintained and encouraged. And it ought to be mentioned that the church, again, the assembly of God's people, the assembly of believers, when they make a declarative statement about the well-being of a person, and their spiritual state, they're not merely stating their opinion, especially when it gets to you know these later stages where you tell it to the church. They are declaring what God has already determined, which is the point of what verse 18 says as we dive back into our text, where it says, truly I say to you, and we remember when Jesus says, truly I say to you, what the ears ought to perk up. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And this passage is often misunderstood and misapplied. As you guys can see in this context, this verse has nothing to do with a lot of the times where you may have heard this phrase, binding, oh, I bind this, I bind that. It doesn't have anything to do with spiritual warfare, financial blessings, or any any you know interpretation foisted upon it by our more charismatic uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord. But rather, this passage is about one thing and one thing only. Jesus giving his authority to the local church to recognize who is already in and who is already out based entirely, solely on what the scriptures have already said. That's what this verse is talking about. We covered this a little bit already when we first saw this phrase back in chapter 16, where Jesus gave this binding and loosing authority to his people. Uh, And we explained that this was a rabbinical expression that was popular at the time. In other words, once your case was heard by the leaders of the synagogue, you were determined to be either bound by the law, meaning that the law and its consequences applied to you, and thence you were bound to it, or its 
or the law and its consequences were not bound to you. They didn't apply in your particular case, and you were then loosed from the law and its consequences. In a sense, you were free to go. That's what this binding and loosing is. None of this is making is people taking authority unto themselves, by the way, to make such declarations. Oh, you're a Christian, we're locking you out of heaven or not. No, they're merely declaring what God has already said in his word. Based on what God has said, you're either in or you're out, based off of your attitude towards your sin. That's how it ties into the greater theme of this passage. And when you think about it, this is, we do this every week here at South Amboy. We do it during the assurance of pardon and uh, the time of confession. I mean, what do I say every week? After we have prayed to confess our sins, I always say, if you meant that prayer, then by the authority, not by me, but by the scriptures, you are forgiven. I say my words very carefully. <laughs> because I'm saying, essentially, if, if you meant that, you are loosed from your sins. They no longer apply to you. You are free by grace from them. And I, again, I choose that language so carefully because I do not have the innate authority to forgive sins. <laughs> Throughout the Gospels, you see people, when Jesus says your sins are forgiven to several people, the people stand up and say, who could forgive sins but God alone? So neither I nor anybody else who, you know, Where's a collar? Can, can declare your sins forgiven or not? It's only, they can only say what God's word says. Because it's literally God's job. What you will find, though, are dozens of verses that clarify what it does take. That simply say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what God's word does say. And Jesus then tells his church that when we agree on this matter, and it's not just us expressing our opinion, (laughs) but the, the very presence of Jesus is with us in agreement with us when we make such a declaration. As we see in verse 19, that says, Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. (laughs) And I'm willing to wager the deed of my house that you guys have heard that verse before. Both of those verses, frankly. But probably not in their intended context. I'm willing to bet that you guys have heard this perhaps used as a magical wishing verse. (laughs) Where people ask for whatever they want simply if you get two people to agree in prayer about something. But that's not what this means. And moreover, if, if such a verse existed in the Bible, I wouldn't have put it in Matthew 18. When talk, especially talking about church discipline, that ought to give us a, a, a context clue as to whether or not it belongs or not, or, or what it might mean, I should rather say. Because it does belong there. It makes sense once you understand the context. And and perhaps just as bad as that last verse that we read, that because you will hear somebody at probably most prayer meetings I've been at, somebody will say, Lord, you say where two or three are gathered in your name, and we got five people here today, so therefore you're with us. That's not what this verse is saying either. Because after all, what if only one person is praying? What happens when you pray when you get up in the morning? When you go into your private prayer closet, when you pray before you go to bed at night, whenever it is that you pray, are, does Jesus, is Jesus somehow absent from hearing your prayers? No, I don't think so at all. <laughs> now, the, uh, the omnipresent God is not somehow absent. <laughs> Rather, when two or three agree on this binding and loosing, to the law, this agreement together, if this person is in a right relationship with God, Jesus says, it will be done for them. And where those same two or three are gathered to do this task, Jesus is with them in their midst, standing in agreement with them as they do so. That's what this verse is talking about. And there are two reasons why I find 
this, this verse actually quite encouraging and super helpful. The first is that I've noticed in, you know, a trend in my own limited experience doing church discipline that most people who go under this process, who people recognize, hey, look, you need to deal with this problem. You can't go around saying you're one of us when, when you have things that you need to deal with. Most people just go on to the next church and start again there, start creating their own problems again. But because Jesus is in the midst of them, because it's Jesus overseeing this process, not an elder board or a pastor, but because Jesus is overseeing this and says such, and he's the one declaring such binding or loosing will be done, you can't run away from this problem. Presumably, Jesus is the same God of your new church. So you might be able to fool me. You might be able to fool another church that you go to. You might be able to run away from people and attempt to run away from your problems. But you can't run from God. The same hound of heaven is going to follow you there too. And secondly, what I love about how it says Jesus is in the midst of them It gives assurance and confidence to the people setting out to follow this difficult process that Jesus is with you. And I love that because nobody enjoys confronting people about their sins. Nobody enjoys this. It is a thankless thankless and painful task. If you enjoy doing this, there's something wrong with you. But isn't it comforting to know that when you step up to do something hard, to do something unpleasant, to have the assurance of Christ himself that he is with you as you do it. I don't know about you, but that gives me strength of heart when I need to step up and do something hard. I think that's why it appears in this verse. So as we draw this to a close this morning, I... I certainly hope for your sake this passage hasn't been too practical as we've been taking it apart. But we remember that the goal of all of this isn't our own boasting in our own superior theology or our own superior spirituality, but rather it's the glory of God, the purity of the church, and the sanctification of the people. It's not about punishment, it's about reconciliation. And nowhere is that made more clear when we are remembered, you know, what does it take to be reconciled? How hard do we have to work to be forgiven by God? Well, that's the wonderful news. <clears throat> the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only message on the planet where salvation, redemption, and reconciliation are as simple as believing the good news. Simply a believing of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, taking the sins that I committed, whatever they were, upon himself, bearing them in his own body on the cross. So all that is required of me is simply believing, confessing, and repenting. That's as complicated as it gets. And by the way, confessing and repenting, that's just outworking of believing. If you really believe, that's what it will look like. It's the natural consequence. And so there is no endless apologizing. There is no begging for forgiveness. There's no person making you stand before a group and, I don't know, say five pre-written prayers facing the east. I don't know. So you won't find that in scriptures. No, it's simply trusting in what Jesus has done for us. And after all, after we have been forgiven so much ourselves, you know, we talked about what it takes to be reconciled to God. What does it take to be reconciled to the church? It should be just as simple. Because after all, God has forgiven us so much, we ought to forgive others as well. That's actually what we're going to be covering next time we open the scriptures together. We'll see that in the the following verses. Because we've seen how we are a humble community, a seeking community, a purified community. 
And we will finally see next week or next time we're together that we are called to be a forgiving community. (laughs) Be prepared to be both encouraged and convicted. Thanks be to God. Amen.